Hi, I'm Jackie Tantillo, and this is Should Have Listened to My Mother. Thanks for all of your support for Should Have Listened to My Mother. You can find us on YouTube and all social media platforms. And please remember to like, even leave a review, and subscribe. It's a big help to all of us here. I think we are all familiar with how controlling fear can be. It can stop us in our tracks, paralyze us. Well, my guest, Julie Campbell, is going to share her personal stories of how she wasn't interested in being controlled and the price she and her mother paid for it. Julie Campbell is a New York actor, writer, and storyteller. She teaches professionals and students how to communicate using techniques from the stage. She knows what it feels like to let fear get in the way. She knows what it's like when told your voice doesn't matter or that you don't belong in the room. And she's the founder of Center Stage Connections. Julie's mom was a registered nurse, then a stay-at-home mom, who took care of all the neighborhood injuries. And when Julie was a child, her mom was an athlete, designer, a seamstress, a dancer, and loved to have fun with her children. At 50, her mom divorced, became a real estate agent, and started a new life. Julie Campbell says we are more than our fears, and she knows firsthand that it's possible to move on from your past and move on from your limiting beliefs. Julie Campbell, welcome to Should Have Listened to My Mother. Thank you, Jackie. I am really excited to be here, and what a lovely introduction. I appreciate all that. You have been working a long time and living through this life experience, so I respect that so much because you've been there, done that, and you've refused to let it get in your way. You've refused mm. to let that control you. And it, and it's for anything. It's for those big things, those little things. It's for making your first video that's going to go on social media. Oh, my gosh, it's so intimidating, these things <laughs> that we do. And then you just say, you know what? Forget it. Just do it. Now you know why yeah. Nike came up with that slogan. <laughs> oh, my gosh. So we are here to talk about the role your mom Liz had in your life. So how about if we start off with what her childhood was like? Do you know much about her experience growing up? I know some of it. Um, <clears throat> my mom grew up on a farm in Indiana, and then her family moved to St. Louis. And she has three brothers. Um her dad was a superintendent of schools. Her mom was a stay-at-home mom. My mom was an incredible athlete when she was young. She was a really, really phenomenal basketball player, really smart, great student, studied hard, went to nursing school. I mean, she grew up in a time where options were more limited for women or the expectations were very different for women put it that way. Sure. And she went to nursing school and she was a fabulous nurse, was very, very good at what she did. And she got married even um, young, but as most people did back then in her early 20s, and left the profession after she had her children. And you're one of how many children? Three. Okay. So at 20 something, I can't even imagine having children in my 20s, but it was a different era then. I got married at 36. <laughs> well, I was not that far from you. And yes, agreed. I was in no way, shape or form ready to get married in yeah. my in my early 20s. No right? way. God, it just kids. was not even a consideration for me. Yeah. And yes, and you look back on that and you think, wow, I was... I was a very different person then. Yeah. And, um, yeah, but that was, that was, it was a different time yep. for sure. And you know what? It's great what they did because these young moms and dads created quite the life for a majority of their children and their families. But I'm curious, where did Liz's life change? Our life began changing after she had 
children, she, and it, precisely when, I don't exactly remember, but m she married my dad, who was a physically and emotionally, emotionally abusive man. And sadly, her dad was that same way as well. That's probably something I uh, left out of, the, of her childhood <laughs> part. Um, okay. I like to, whenever I talk about my mom, I like to lift up all of those wonderful things about her. Mm -hmm. The reality, though, was that she grew up in a home that was physically and emotionally abusive to her own mother, my grandmother, who my daughter is named after, by the way, because I loved her. And that's what she learned. That's what my mother learned. And that was normalized. She married a man who was similar in many ways. And she lived most of her life in fear of what was going to come through the door. She was uber protective of us as her children, wanted nothing but the best for us in every way for our education, mostly, for our experiences. And the choices that she made were all about doing what she felt was best for us as her children. She always put us before she put herself. Well, I'm sure she put herself in front of you to protect you as well, right? Obviously, yes. you guys were her priority. So her mother yes. was abusive? And your dad. dad. So my mom's dad, my dad, both abusive. My mom's mom said some verbally, my mom has shared with me some verbally abusive things that my grandmother shared with her. But you know what? It's all, you know this, that physical or emotional abuse, they all leave their scars. Some of them are more visible than others. And it just was not... It was a very difficult environment for my mom growing up, and it was a very difficult environment for her to live the life that she probably really truly imagined that was impossible for her in the situation that she was in. Did she remarry? Has she remarried since? No. no. Would she ever consider that, another relationship with someone, or she wants nothing to do with it? She told me that she couldn't really imagine doing that. I've asked her that question, or she's brought it up. Yeah, she's entitled to be happy, right? But she doesn't 100%. need someone else. She doesn't need someone else to make her happy either. That's true, too. So how did she, because it seems like she's got a lot of wonderful attributes, right? She was caring mm -hmm. and loving and athletic and creative and all of this, how did she hang on to that sunny disposition in a way? I mean, did she just com compartmentalize things? Compartmentalize, interesting word, yeah. Um, you know, she, she hung on to that part of herself by being involved in her kids' lives, my lives, my brother's lives. She was our basketball coach. She was my softball coach. She was the place where we had huge slumber parties at my house. Friends were always welcome at our house. And she was kind of like the cool mom who my friends talked to about their angst and their issues. And she was also, she had a really fun mischievous side to her, mm. which was, which was really terrific. There was a, I'll tell you a little, give you a little um, nugget here. Mm -hmm. She was our softball and baseball coach. And I was, in elementary school, she back when I was a kid, toilet papering, TPing is what we called it. Sure, was something you would do at nighttime, and it was a sh it was a sign of affection for someone. It wasn't something it, that was meant to be malicious in any way. You toilet papered people's houses who you liked. It was a little bit of a prank, and it was a fun thing. And very often, you knew that if you toilet papered somebody's house, it, they were likely to find out who you were and get you back. <laughs> <laughs> so it was sort of a thing when I was growing up. It sure. was just sort of a fun thing that kids did. So she got us, loaded us all into our giant station wagon when we were in elementary school and got us to go to our assistant coach's house who had 
huge trees. One was a giant, giant oak tree in the front of their house to toilet paper their house. We went to the grocery store. We bought those giant reams of toilet paper. It was obvious what we were doing and went to his house. It was very late at night, snuck up there, toilet papered the house. And just as we were finishing up, the lights came on mm. in his house. <laughs> My mom is parked like a couple houses down the street so that <laughs> if they were to come out, they wouldn't be able to see the car. Mm-hmm. All of us run, get in the car. We're, we're going down the street. And I realized one of my friends wasn't in the car. Oh, no. Ah. <laughs> so we're thinking, where, where is she? Where is she? Where is she? And one of my friends said, I think she's still up in the tree. <laughs> so this was one of my very tall basketball player friends who was able to reach up onto a branch and pull herself up into the tree. And she was She was left up in the tree. So we waited about 10 minutes or so. And we went back to get her. (laughs) She jumped down from the tree. And it was, I I actually saw her at a reunion recently. And we we still talk about that story. Mm -hmm. And that was my mom doing. Like she was, she was a lot of fun and harmless, fun, frank, frank, and giggly laughing with her kids was a, where she was happiest yeah. and still is happy. That's pretty doing great. Doing those things with her kids and with her grandchildren. What gift or gifts has your mom given you in light of the story that you just shared with us and other stories? I would say persistence, tenacity, believing in things will always be better that hard work will get you ultimately what you want not to give up to believe in yourself even though i saw her every day not believing in who she was she just didn't have support around her that taught her that i'll share something else with you that when i when i say that that there was a duality that existed when I was growing up because my mom was all of those wonderful things I just shared about her and her, her spirit and her humor. And the reality though, was there were many, many very dark moments that, that I grew up with. And as I said, my dad was very physically abusive and his words were just as bad. I'll share with you a story that I like to say is a bit of a trigger warning for anyone I was in this this station wagon that I told you about when I was young. We were all coming back from a road trip to visit my grandparents, her parents. The kids were all in the back. The seats were folded down. And my dad was very angry about something that had happened. I don't really remember what it was. My mom was in the front seat. My dad was driving. It was a warm day. The windows were open in the car. And something happened that triggered my dad. And he punched my mom in the face while he was driving. Her sunglasses flew off and went out of the window. My dad pulled over, insisted all of us get out on this. I don't remember. I think it was an on-ramp to a highway. The shoulder of the road, we'll call it. And insisted we all get out of the car and look for her sunglasses. And we weren't going to continue on our journey until we found them. I don't really remember whether we found them or not. But we did continue along the journey. We went to a fast food place. My dad insisted we all ordered food. None of us felt like eating. My mom was a mess. I knew that she was going to end up with a big welt on her face. And we drove hundreds of miles back to our home without having started our trip. And that wasn't an unusual, that was not an unusual thing that would happen. So there'd be complete silence in the car? Or would would you guys all start acting like nothing happened? It probably started with complete silence. And then eventually, after miles and miles and miles, I suppose, acted like nothing happened. That was the go-to thing, though, that you learn when you grow up in that environment. When was that you don't talk about what happens at home with other people. There were times when I did share when I was a little bit older 
with a friend or two. And I got in a lot of trouble for it from both of my parents. There was shame, there was embarrassment. I knew though that this was whatever it was. Like, you know, you said that my mom got in front of us to protect us. And yes, she did. And that wasn't okay with me. It just, it was, it's never okay with a kid. Kids know that that's not okay. I came home from school one day. My parents had been on a business trip. They were supposed to be away. I, we had had a sitter taking care of us while they were away for the a few days. I came home from school. My mom was sitting at our dining room table. She turned and looked at me and her eyes were black and her nose was probably broken. And I knew immediately what had happened. She'd been away on a trip with my dad. He'd been drinking or not. He was a heavy drinker. And the good thing was, though, is that she had decided to come home. And I don't really remember. I was trying to think about this. I don't really remember if she drove herself home or she flew home. I don't really even recall. But she was sitting there. And I remember saying to her, we can't, you can't do this anymore. And I was probably in maybe somewhere between like fourth and sixth grade or something. I don't really even recall. But pretty young to have to say that to your mom. Pretty young. Yeah. And young enough that you know we needed a sitter to be there and sure. help us with getting to school and cooking and all of that. So in any case, shortly, I don't, and, and, and I will say that these are memories and they don't always happen in a linear fashion. And when you, when you grow up with family trauma, there are different things that stick with you each individual that they stick with. And this is how I remember things. And this is not any kind of chronological, necessarily chronological order, but I do remember associating that with another moment where my mom did make a decision to have my dad removed from the house. And we were told the night before to pack a bag. Bags went over to our neighbor's house. We were supposed to sit at the dining room table and do our homework. And when the doorbell rang. We were to get up, leave through the side door, and it was going to be the police who were going to tell my dad that he had X amount of minutes to leave the house and there was a restraining order put on him. Prior to that, mind you, the police had been at our house many, many times with you know, the worrying police lights and all of that. And it just was kind of what happened. We grew up in a very, quote unquote, normal suburban neighborhood. In any case, we left, and um, shortly after that, we had all the locks changed on the house, had bars put on the house, and my mom was sitting at the at my dad's desk, and he had an office at home, and she was sitting at his desk, and I noticed she was sitting there one day, it's probably after school again, and I came in, and she said she was filling out, filling out an application to go back to nursing school to finish, she would finished her degree, so I don't know if it was a a job application. In any case, she was going to see about and was looking towards going back to nursing. And I remember distinctly saying to her, because she always did this for us. I'm getting a little emotional as I'm telling this story. Mom, I will make our lunches at night before we Go to bed so they're ready for us in the morning. You don't have to pack our lunches in the morning. Or I'll get up early and make our lunches if you have to work. We can't do this anymore. We can't live like this anymore. And whatever the course of action was after that, she didn't end up going back to work. She did not. That was the struggle that she faced. She was very threatened by our financial situation. If she were to leave, we were not going to have money to go to college. All of the things that were near and dear to my mom's heart, which was to providing a happy, healthy life for her kids, were going to be pulled out from under her. If she went back to work, if she revealed what was really happening at, happening at home, which did happen, 
My dad's boss found out about it once when he saw my mom at the airport and he was supposed to go into therapy, but he never really did. So it just ultimately, my mom made those decisions to, to protect us, to continue giving us those, those things and the possibilities that she wanted for us, which was a better life than what she had. Did she let your dad come back? He came back into the house after this oh, one. Yes. So he was yes. back in and the abuse continued. Yes. Okay. And how did she manage to decide to get divorced? Where did she get the strength to do that? Were you all out of the house and we were adults? we were all out of the house. We'd all finished school and grad school and a couple of us were getting ready to get married. And it was, kind of, it was kind of a series of things that happened, not the least of which that she had found out my dad had done some things with their joint account that mm, was not okay. Right. Um, and had just continued to abuse her. I think that the physical abuse slowed down a bit, but he just diminished her with his words. Did the same thing to me. I would often talk back to him and it just made things worse. Told him that what he was saying about me wasn't true. He didn't know what he was talking about and it just made him angrier. Are you the oldest of the siblings? I'm the middle. You're the middle. And what kind of relationship did your brothers have? We all had very yeah. different relationships with him. And as he aged and all of that, you know, we, I don't want to speak for them. Um, it's just that you, every, each person in a house like that finds their way to hope, to manage, to protect themselves. Yeah, survive the whole thing. Survive. Yeah. Um, and we've all, we've all been affected by that. We've all been changed by it. And we each carry on well, with you it, have, as does my you mom. You have to. You have to, uh, as long as everyone is in a healthy relationship, I guess that's key, is to oh. not to continue yes, yes, yes. The, the trauma or be codependent on someone. You have to break the cycle. Yes to that. We've all moved on and are in a healthy relationship. That's, um, that's amazing. It's important to note that. And I remind my mom of that now when we have those we have those conversations from time to time if she'll bring it's very hard for my mom to talk about these things it's not easy for me to talk about them mm -hmm. but i remind her of that and that she'll bring up a moment from t from time to time and i will say to her you did the best that you could i we've we've my mom and i have pulled together have, have come together and come apart various times throughout my life that's been deeply influenced by my history growing up and i still remind her of there's still lots of possibility out there. She's very independent. She still mows her own yard mm -hmm. and gets doesn't like the lawn service that's supposed to be mowing it, doing it, because they don't do it the way they're supposed to. She's, <laughs> she's one of these people who learned to do a lot of stuff around our house because she had to. And that's one thing we, we asked her, what did I learn from my mom? That if she didn't know how to fix something, he would find out how to fix it. And by the way, we didn't have the internet back then. Sure. You had to read a and book or you had to go to the yeah. library and you had to get a book. <laughs> yes. But and you, uh, took care of our lawn and did all that. So she still does that. She digs up root balls of trees to help people move them. And she's in her 80s. Oh, that's, she sounds like yeah. my kind of gal. <laughs> she's, she's great. She's got a lot of energy and she's the, she's, the envy of uh, a lot of my friends who have sadly lost their parents. She's like, she's going strong. That's pretty incredible. Some people may take offense to this. Do you believe that you had to have this experience to become who you are today, personally and professionally? Mm. 
don't know that I had to have had that experience. I have taken what I have learned from all of those experiences and I have, and I would say those stories really, and have reshaped, reframed, rewritten them to give me the inside energy <laughs> and the optimism to believe that something it, like my mom used to say, it's all going to work out. She used to say that all the time. It's all going to work out. Even when I saw from day to day that it wasn't always going to work out. Right. But in the long term, what I've been able to do, and I still carry a lot of self-doubt, a lot of lack of self-belief at times in what I can do. I say to my kids, and I, I've had these conversations very openly with my own children, and what I've said to them is that when you when you see something over and over and over again or you hear something over and over and over again you believe informs the truth of who you are you start to believe it that repetition yeah i mean that's that happened to my mom that happened to me i was able to leave that house eventually i went to college i went to graduate school i moved i lived all around the country i have a wonderful husband and children I got away from that, and I didn't do that by myself. I had my mom's support in doing that. But I've been able to take from those moments, and I've, I've put this into my the business that I have now in taking the lessons that I've learned from my life on and off the stage to helping professionals understand how you can reshape, rewrite your own narrative to live the life to do the work that you imagine, whether that's leading a team, whether that's asking for a promotion, whether that's doing a keynote address. But what I try to do is I look back on what I did as a kid and what I do now, which is to actively choose to be courageous instead of trying to appear confident. That's what always troubled me as a kid was I had to act one way, like everything was fine outside of the house when I was petrified about what was going to happen at night, my dad came home and was mad about something. Oh, it's so hard. You can always be courageous. You can do you can do whatever you want to do, scared, nervous, or uncomfortable. You can still choose to do that. That's something I learned from my life, and that's something that actors do every day. You can choose to be present, be in the moment, speak with intention, listen to understand. You can choose presence over perfection. Center Stage Connections is exactly what you do in working with your clients to apply yes. wherever they are standing, whatever they are feeling, whatever, wherever, whatever just happened in the room before they came in to see you. You have to apply that as you move forward. And that's what actors do. Yes, that's our job is to step into the role as fully and completely as we are able to. That's what acting is about. Acting is about telling the truth. It's about investing yourself fully and completely in each moment by moment by moment. Because when you choose to be invested in your in your story, your audience comes along. They want to learn more about you and what you do, regardless of what the, your profession is. And that's how you build a connect with people, you build relationships, and you grow your businesses with those things. So could I be doing what I do now as a business owner and helping people figure out how to make that keynote address? Who I'm talking with too much jazz hands and I've got too many gestures and I'm using too many filler words like, like, um, uh, you know, basically, how do I fix all of that stuff? How do I edit myself? Yeah. <laughs> Clean out all the extra stuff that you don't need. Yes. So, you know, what I help people do is I, the origin stories that I've shared with you when I work long term with people, that's the place where we start in. I realize you don't have to have a generational trauma story to be worried or to be nervous or uncomfortable. What I do is I take those storytelling strategies, those exercises from the stage that actors use to step into a role. I take that exercise and I apply it to whatever your life is. Let's take a look at that. Share what you want to share. No pressure to share anything. It's not therapy. I'm not a therapist. But I will say that I am told over and over again that those exercises are therapeutic. 
And people have a lot of insight and discovery about, oh, wow, this is who I am and this is who I want to be. And I can do that. So it's that internal work that actors do to put together a character. And then we work on some, some of the external stuff too. The technical pacing pauses. Where do you stand? Where's the camera? Where's the light? Look into the camera. Are you bringing in, a, are you talking to a virtual audience? Are you talking to a hybrid audience? Are there people, are you, are you doing a live event? Whatever it is, those are all things that I have learned over my 30 plus years on the stage. And yes, from my life as well. Center Stage Connections. You can find Julie at julie at centerstageconnections.com. Julie Campbell, thank you so much for joining me. Thank you, Jackie. And we'll be back next week with another episode of Should Have Listened to My Mother.